Hello, welcome back. Today's topic is feminism and engineering. We shall be taking a look at recent developments at Purdue University's engineering department. You might think that certain fields within the academy are relatively immune to regressive influences. Empirical endeavours such as engineering should be well insulated from the general nonsense infesting most of the humanities. Sadly, as we shall discover, this is simple complacency. Political activists have discovered the soft underbelly of the engineering disciplines and are exploiting these weaknesses ruthlessly. To paraphrase Christopher Hitchens, how far the termites have spread and how long and well they've dined. The academic termites are forever busy, it seems. And as we shall discover, they have begun feasting within the engineering department of Purdue University. So, let's begin. Purdue University has hired Donna Riley as its new head of its School of Engineering and Education. Professor Riley was Associate Professor of Engineering at Smith College. She holds a BSc in Chemical Engineering from Princeton University and a PhD in Engineering and Public Policy from Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Riley is a self-declared feminist and queer activist. You might ask at this point, what is the relevance of her activism? Well, that will become obvious as we adventure into her world. When we review her Smith College biography page and review her publications, we discover such masterpieces as Sex, Fear and Condescension on Campus, Cyber Censorship at Carnegie Mellon University, published 1996. Carnegie Mellon, if you recall, is her alma mater. Another publication, Employing Liberative Pedagogies in Engineering Education, published in 2003. In 2005, Dr. Riley received a career award from the National Science Foundation to support her work. This might be a point worth noting for American taxpayers, because this award covers a five-year period and amounts to $500,000. And what did the taxpayer receive in return for this quite substantial investment? Well, in 2005, she published Common Ground, how a course collaboration between engineering and women's studies produced fine art. In 2006, we also have Power Knowledge, using Foucault to promote critical understanding of content and pedagogy in engineering thermodynamics, a title I'm still trying to decipher. And then perhaps my favourite, also published in 2006, You're All a Bunch of Fucking Feminists. Then we have a book, Engineering and Social Justice, which we shall take a look at. And finally, in 2008, we have Feminisms in Engineering Education, Transformative Possibilities, published in the National Women's Studies Association Journal. I could only find one review of her book, Engineering and Social Justice. We can assume it's a fair description because the reviewer was quite enthusiastic. But what was stated as contained in the book is interesting. The reviewer said, and I quote, Riley provides an impressively readable introduction to social justice theories and practices for engineers. By using jokes about engineers and real-world cases about whistleblowing and other engineering ethics challenges, Riley makes the likes of Marx, Poirot Ferreri and Augusto Boal accessible to someone otherwise not versed in this world of philosophy. The reference to Marx here, and her earlier references to Foucault in her publication Power Knowledge, should leave you in no doubt about her political leanings, and her affinity for postmodernism is patent. Her advocacy is political. It is founded on Marxist ideology, obfuscated by postmodernist nonsense, and dressed as social justice all of which is funded by the American taxpayer and remains unchallenged within the academy itself. Now, usually I leave personal traits out of my videos. I don't usually refer to someone's sex or sexuality as defining. But in the case of Dr. Riley, we will have to touch on the topic because it informs her professional worldview. And regrettably, we have an individual who is pretty much egocentric. In a recent article titled Queered Science Interview on the website autostraddle.com, She recounted an experience she had at Princeton University where she was excitedly participating in an event called Gay Jeans Day. Apparently this was to raise awareness of gay issues. She said in the article, and I quote, We advertised this in every mailbox. 
every signpost, everywhere, so no one was clueless about what day it was. I shall skip her references to fellow students, because the interesting part related to her professor. She went on to say, and I quote, I remember sitting in my Chem E classroom waiting for the professor to walk in. Most of my classmates in khakis, some with microaggressions scribbled on their shirts, adrenaline shooting through my veins as each year there was typically a conversation where the men would express something homophobic like no way, wouldn't be caught dead wearing jeans or whatever, and our professor would stroll in not wearing jeans either, possibly actually oblivious, or possibly comfortably homophobic. There was utter silence from them on any and all social issues. Notice the phrasing. Either the professor was oblivious, or comfortably homophobic, or perhaps, as I might suggest, simply indifferent, or had other concerns, other than that of an excited, somewhat self-absorbed female student. How self-entitled would you have to be that when enthusiastic about participating in activism, you would expect everyone, students and faculty alike, to simply be on board with whatever activity you had decided was appropriate for them? Unfortunately, this is a theme that runs through this academic entire body of work. In the next section we shall listen as Dr Donna Riley and one of the co-authors and editors of the book Engineering and Social Justice, Dr Alice Pawley, express their vision for the future of engineering. Listen carefully and you will detect some common stock phrases. We will start by listening to a recent Dr Riley video. A link to the full video will be in the description box below. First, we have Dr. Riley's thoughts on corporate America. Social justice is a very difficult thing to define. It's much easier to define social injustice. And one big question that social justice advocates might ask is who gets to define what social justice is? So social justice then ought to be defined by people who are experiencing injustice. And that might lead us to a set of issues where we could juxtapose engineering and social justice and begin to ask, how is it that engineering has contributed to different kinds of injustice in the world? And if we ask that question, one of the first things that might come to mind in the United States in particular is militarism. When you think about a list of the top employers for engineers in the country, and you think about the top list of defense contractors, there's a lot of overlap between these two lists. Engineers are heavily involved in developing military technologies. Second, we might ask about engineers' involvement in, in corporate America and in serving profit motives over people. And third, we might think about who is allowed to do engineering and who is engineering done for. When we ask who does engineering, we're reminded that engineering has, for decades, had a problem of underrepresentation of both women and minorities in the profession. So there we have it. Her advice to future engineers is to avoid the larger employers like the plague. There is a definite conflict here, isn't there? In that our universities are putting an ever larger financial burden on students, yet there are those within the academy who are hostile to some of the largest potential employers. It's all rather surreal. Whether you agree with Dr. Riley's assessment or not, it is not the role of professional bodies to set or determine public policy. These are political matters that need to be decided by government through the democratic process. If militarization is an issue, then it is society that needs to address it, not engineers. Anyway, it gets worse. Let's continue. In engineering, we might similarly think about what would public interest engineering look like? Or how could pro bono engineering allow those who cannot otherwise afford engineering to experience some of the benefits of engineering. So we might imagine a tradition in which engineers do pro bono work and begin to serve other communities. Her students, many having worked in the service sector to support themselves through university, will be told that the virtuous path is working pro bono for some Peruvian women's collective. I think I detect a distinct political flavour in Dr. Riley's statements. There is no sacrifice she is not prepared for her students to make in the service of her utopian ideals. You will detect this type of thinking as a reoccurring theme when listening to both these academics. 
Another way that engineers have been involved in the fight for social justice has been in corporations where they're working. One thing that engineers have done is blown the whistle when they have access to information that they believe the public ought to know. But there are other forms of working for social justice in corporate settings that might also be effective but less dramatic than whistleblowing, that is working for change from within. My hope for my students is that they will ultimately be able to find jobs that align well with their values and that those students that are committed to social justice can find opportunities that are outside of the status quo of serving either military or corporate ends and allows them to fulfill their commitment to build a more socially just world. I've listened to the available videos and read a few articles penned by or about Dr. Riley and these audio clips are not unrepresentative. The links will be provided in the description box below if you have any concerns relating to contacts. Next up, we will listen to Dr. Riley's fellow traveller, Comrade Pauli, co-author and fellow editor of Engineering and Social Justice. First, Dr. Pauli's take on engineering and colonisation. So the big reasons are that engineers have had a role in creating a lot of the social problems that we have. <laughs> Um, including economic and income inequity, um, including resource use, which drove things like colonization um, and which drives a lot of the major geopolitical issues that we have today. Climate change being another huge thing that con engineers contributed to um, with sociopolitical and ecological consequences. Well, that was interesting, but not as interesting as Dr. Pauli's take on gender studies. Well, my, my colleagues have a longer history of working on this than I do. Um, when I was an undergrad, I, I vaguely knew that, that engineers would have a job at the end of college. Um, and I wasn't even aware that, for example, that women were so underrepresented in engineering. Um, I went to school in Canada at McGill University uh, in chemical engineering, and we were almost half-half. So I wasn't even aware of the sort of demographic participation in my own classroom, let alone um, what sort of impacts engineers could have on the world. <laughs> I did go into my undergraduate program wanting to um, solve environmental problems. So I had that knowledge. Um, but it wasn't until the middle of my third year of undergrad that I suddenly realized that, in fact, faculty aren't usually taught how to teach, and that seemed wrong. Um, and that led me into thinking about engineering education. And then I had a colleague who recommended I take a women's studies class, which was the biggest eye-opening experience I have ever had intellectually. And that set me down the path around, around social justice. Not just that the sort of the topics of engineering could be socially just, but how they went about doing their work as engineers, or how they even thought about the world could have implications for and around oppression. I had never thought of that. Now, that being said, my colleagues have, uh, my co-editor colleagues and then the authors, um, have longer histories of social activism, of uh, participating in public engagement of science and engineering. Um, so I, I would say, it, it varies, but there's now a name. Engineering and social justice is a, is a concept that people put together and search on, and there are journals with it. And so it's, I wouldn't say it's new, but it has certainly developed a critical mass. You know, and forgive me if you think I'm being too harsh here, but what we have just heard is probably one of the main reasons that gender studies in its present form should be driven from the academy. It seems to me a destructive force with no redeeming features. It intellectually disables entire cohorts of students for no practical benefit. Anyway, next up is Pauli's explanation as to why engineers should not be concerned with the application of their skills in an industrial or commercial setting. So, students explicitly tend to be taught about um, what scum scholars are calling microethics which is making sure that your individual practice of an, as, as an engineer is legal and professionally sound, 
um, and that you make sort of ethical good decisions. And they don't have a lot of conception about a bigger picture situating their practice as engineers in a bigger macroethical picture um, and their role as practitioners in reproducing that bigger picture. Um, so examples, um, so most examples that engineering students see in their day-to-day -day classes are in projects and so forth come for these industrial or commercial contexts. So they start to think that engineering is about solving problems in commercial and industrial contexts. Um, and they tend to be ones solve it, solved in first world high tech contexts. Um, they don't really think about how engineering can be applied to solving problems of marginalized communities, um, communities that can't pay for engineering labor, um, or that the solving of the problems aren't themselves focused on paid labor. It's always a connection with this will be your professional job for which you will be paid. They, it doesn't really occur to them they could do engineering pro bono or on, on um, uh, along with community members or teaching others about engineering practice as just part of who they are. So this is actually proving more and more problematic to lots of students who want to make a positive dis difference in the world and they see this industrial and commercial context as being somewhat complicit in problematic or oppressive structures. They don't want to um, be people who go and make huge amounts of profit to the detriment of communities. They don't want to be the ones who cause sort of untold ecological harm to people who have no recourse to communities other than themselves. Um, they want to be part of a bigger, a bigger thing that makes the world a better place. Uh, we, we talk about a phrase actually, engineers can make a world of difference. And usually that's in an aspirational way and not a equally valid and scary problematic way as well. So how do we reach those students then who want to make a world of difference in a good sense, having stripped all context from the examples that they see in class? So instead, let's rethink how we teach them the subjects of engineering, the context in which they care about the building of the widget. Um, so in our first year engineering class that we teach here at, at Purdue, um, we have an example not just of a, uh, create some kind of widget, but instead how do you create a device that um, makes peanut butter for a women's co-op in Haiti that's been impacted by the earthquake. So in this section, Paulie encourages us to think of the bigger picture and consider macroethics. And as her example, she uses a scenario where our imagined engineer is working tirelessly to solve the issue of peanut butter production for a women's collective in an earthquake zone. Pro bono, of course, because women's. Well, sorry if I come over as all linear male here, but that sounds batshit crazy, to be honest. Finally, towards the end of this particular interview, we have this. The, that being said, one of the issues that concerns us, uh, me in particular, um, is that the rate at which women are going into engineering in the U.S. is actually decreasing. So we still keep getting more and more women each year, but if we keep going at the same rate, we're not going to get to 50%. And so something else needs to happen for us to um, equally represent our general population um, in our engineering population. And my current theory is that we have lots of work trying to investigate, you know, women themselves, um, reduce sexism, reduce um, un implicit and unconscious bias in recruiting, retaining, teaching um, women. Um, but it's not working, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, or not to, not to the extent that we would expect it for the amount of effort that we're putting in. So that's where my research comes in. So I'm the editor of the book, a co-editor of the book, but also an author. And I think that we could construct this thing called engineering to take 
a focus and an interest in the problems that have historically been those of women and which in much of the rest of the world still are the problems of women. Um, and until we do that, until we make engineering a more socially just discipline in terms of gender, a less gendered discipline, uh, we shouldn't wonder why women aren't wanting to participate in it. And this is the same for people of color and same for people um, of poorer classes. So women are underrepresented in the US. We are not alone. But we need to do some stuff differently, I think, if we're going to solve this problem. Did you notice the long pause before she had to admit that all the time, money and effort thrown at this ideological project was not working? But there was no self-reflection here, no consideration or re-evaluation. Her solution is more of the same. More social justice content, more changes in the curriculum, more discrimination, more indoctrination, until outcome meets requirement. To use an engineering term, her project is suffering from cyclical failure. The sad part is, I suspect, she knows this is the case, but has become invested in a particular world view she can no longer escape. So, there we have it. The queering of engineering at Purdue University. This should be a concern for any field of study that believes it is immune from the tide of social justice advocacy. Academics who lean towards Marxist ideology are seeping into these departments, usually by the educational route. Employers will not be enthusiastic in their recruitment of engineers who have been taught that political advocacy in the workplace is virtuous. Parents of potential students now need to be aware not only of the academic standards that prevail within university departments, but also the political environment that these departments cultivate as well. We end our adventure at this point. I hope you found something of interest in this video. If you would like to support my channel, I now have a Patreon page. If you're unable to support my work through Patreon, then you can share, like, or comment. It's all good. Thank you for watching.